Monday is by far my favorite day of the week. It's akin to standing at the starting line to a race, where the entire journey, the entire week, is ahead of you. You have everything to look forward to. It's all systems go on Monday. Also, I hate Fridays. What keeps you motivated? What keeps me motivated? Well, in short, I'm here. All of my dreams and aspirations are here. And the only thing in between these two is a bunch of work. So tackling that work is a way of moving this needle. That's all the motivation I need. I love progress in any manifestation. Yeah, I don't, motivation's never, I've never struggled with motivation, ever. All right, this, this is a theory of mine, but I genuinely believe this. I think you can supplement sleep with exercise. What I literally mean by that is, say you sleep eight hours a night. If you took two of those hours and spent them exercising and only slept six hours, you would be less tired and in general feel better. It is just a theory though. Let's talk about running. All right, first, big picture. This is what matters and the body is just there to like keep this thing running, the brain. Big picture. All right, what is freedom? Uh, I think I stole this from Bob Dylan, but maybe I stole this from Woody Guthrie. Freedom for me is waking up in the morning and going to sleep at night and in between doing exactly what I want to do. What's the secret to happiness? The secret to happiness is finding something you love and then doing that for the rest of your life. I stole that from Rushmore. Uh, Cameron wants to know, what is your favorite book? My favorite book is the autobiography of Malcolm X. I've read that book like three times, twice in a row, and you can pretty much learn everything you need to know about life in that book. The best piece of advice I have for someone trying to succeed in the film industry or any creative space is if you're doing what everyone else is doing, you're doing it wrong. My friend Andy Spade, who's basically a genius, once said to me that work and family would make a great name for a business because that's all there is in life, work and family. And I couldn't agree more. If you can figure out work and you can figure out family, you will be happy in life. I've definitely got work figured out. Yes, I'm going to bed at 9 p.m. Because when it comes to sleep, don't mess with me. I was trying to say something. When it comes to sleep, how does it go? The early bird gets the worm. No, that's not it. It goes, when it comes to sleep, a fool sleeps when he has to, a wise man sleeps when he can. Right? I just, I like to sleep whatever. <laughs> I thrive on the constant stress that is having more things that I need to do than I have time to do them. I always keep a backlog of things that I need to do just in case I have a free moment so I can do that. I never want free time. Free time is the enemy of progress. I hope that doesn't make me sound crazy. Somebody said something mean to me yesterday on Twitter. Here's the thing about being mean. It's a lot easier to be mean than it is to be nice. So mean people, on top of being jerks, they're also lazy and they're uninventive. Being nice takes work. That's why I really like people that are really nice. I wanna talk about risk. As a guiding principle, life shrinks and life expands in direct proportion to your willingness to assume risk. Yeah, I've, like, I've made some really stupid decisions in my career for my entire career. On a broad plane, they've all worked out. Every time I've quit my jobs, which I've done every time I've had a job, people that I trust most, the people that I love, all advised against it. My dad told me not to move to New York City because it was such a risk. And every time I, every time I took these bigger risks, the opportunity for a larger payout was always there. Life is like this super temporary, mega fragile thing. You only get like a nugget of time to really pursue the things you care about. And like I'm 30, 30, and my rule is that the right time is always right now. To put a little meat on these bones, this new company that I don't really talk about, this new company is the biggest risk I've ever taken. 
I took five years of my life to build my advertising career and I made like a lot of money. I've been doing really great. Look at my YouTube channel, go all the way back. The last branded content thing you'll see was in February of 2014. I ditched it all to pursue something I knew nothing about. This huge risk. And I did it at a time when my wife was pregnant and there was all of this vulnerability and all this scariness in my life. And even now at 33, my dad said, 34, my dad said, Casey, that's crazy. You've got a good thing, don't let it go. But I know that like someday I won't be able to do this. I know that the time is now. The time, the right time is always now. So I had to do it. That's how I feel about risk in general. And that's what the struggle has always been for me is like identifying risk, identifying fear, and then just smashing through it. Because a, a fear is looking back and wishing that I had done these things. The most dangerous thing you can do in your career, the most dangerous thing you can do in life is play it safe. Adam wants to know, tell me how to succeed as in motivation. I can't tell you that. You have to find your own motivation. Can't rely on other people. Andrew wants to know, how do you surround yourself with the right people? That's a great question. I don't know how to surround yourself with the right people. What I do is like eliminate the bad people. If you're somebody that I don't want in my life, get out. How do you not give a shit about what anyone thinks and just do your own thing? That's a two part answer to a two part question. The first part about how do you just do your own thing. In life you have two options. You can do your own thing and stand out, or you can do what you're supposed to do, you can do what everyone else does, and you can fit in. There's nothing wrong with fitting in, but you're fitting into cultural or societal norms that were created by other people. Now, in some cases these norms are great, um, but in others they don't make sense. These norms, these rules, were created by someone someone just like you or someone just like me. I don't know who created these norms. Chances are they weren't anyone smarter than you or me. And if I'm not a fan of the way things are, I just do my own thing because I trust myself and I trust my perspective more so than that of other people. Part two, how do you not give a shit about what people think of you? Mm. I should preface this answer by saying I definitely got made fun of a lot for the way that I look when I was in school and all those bullies that picked on me are all losers now. So never forget that. People who judge others, especially people who judge others based on things like looks, on whether you're black or white, whether you're Jewish or you're Muslim, whether you are gay or straight, because of their body type, whether they're fat or skinny, whether you have pimples or whether you have a big butt. These judgmental people, their opinions don't matter because they don't matter. Judgmental people are of a lower moral authority than those who don't judge. And we, people who don't judge, we have a responsibility to crush, to destroy those mean, judgmental bullies. And we do that with an overwhelming positivity and we do that with our extreme open-mindedness. And when you subscribe to those, those values, you really stop caring what other people think. Because chances are, if other people are judging you, they're wrong. Life, life is so much better when you have someone to share it with. When you have family to share it with, it's great. When you have friends to share it with, it's amazing. And if you're really, really lucky, if you meet a stranger in your lifetime and decide that you want to share your life with that stranger, that's amazing. That is the that is one of the greatest parts of life. A shared life is a great life. There are, there are two things in life that I think really define who you are as a person, really shape who you are as a person. There's education and there's experience. And when it comes to experience, there's the kind that you pursue, like a trip, or deciding to like kiss that girl for the first time, or kiss that boy for the first time. And then there's a the kind of experience that just happens to you. Um, like when I got hit by a car and broke my leg. And those experiences, they, they have a huge impact on who you are and they affect who you are for the rest of your life. Harry wants to know, do you learn more from success or failure? You wanna take a stab at this? Um, yeah, I'd say, I think I learn more from failure. I guess all of us have this need or want to succeed in some way but when you fail at something especially when it's like a dramatic fail 
you really makes you stop and take count and think like, why did I fail? Like, how can I avoid this? I think that it's always the toughest times in your life that define who you are, much more so than the easiest times or the best times. So failures are typically some of the hardest times of your life. So when I look back and I see all sort of the pivotal moments in my life, it was always the struggle. It was always the failure that motivated me, um, not the like loveliness of success. What's the best advice you would give to someone who's worried about their future, what to do after school? My advice is always the same, which is keep yourself extremely busy. As long as you're doing something, you will find your path. Mm -hmm. It's when you get lazy that everything becomes skewed, everything becomes gray or foggy. It's easier to, yeah, on the back of that, it's easier to steer something that's already moving. If you're just static and stationary, it's so hard to build momentum. So. You're a poet, Lou. Yeah. yeah. I have my Snapchat set, so anybody can send me snaps, like people I don't know, strangers and stuff. And the snap that I get the most are from people, and it just says, bored. Or it's like a selfie of them, and they're like, bored, nothing to do. How are there this many people that have all this time and no way to occupy it? You could build a city with all the free time that people spend sitting around being bored, sending me snaps of themselves sitting around being bored. Seneca said, it's not that we have a short time to live, but that we waste a lot of it. Thank you, Ryan, for turning me on to that quote. And that pretty much sums it up. Right now it's go time for me. I wanna maximize every waking second. I'm never gonna get any younger, but right now I'm completely healthy, I'm full of energy, and who knows how long this will last. I doubt it's gonna be like that when I'm 50 or 60 years old, so I wanna do it now. With that, I wanted to share a little bit of my thinking behind that, like a little bit of the logic and then the mechanics behind maximizing or my consideration for really maximizing every day. And I know that this is like, this is, this is crazy person talk, but the truth is the only time I really get bummed out or depressed is, is when I'm not being productive, is when I'm not accomplishing or doing or contributing in any way. Nothing makes me less happy than relaxation and sitting around with nothing to do. But why I'm so emphatic about all of this is that I think life is substantiated by whatever impact or whatever contribution you can make while you're alive. The finish line is the same for everyone. We're all ending up in the same place, but while we're here, what, what contribution can you make? Work and building things and making things and doing things and spending time with your family, those are the ways that I feel I'm contributing, that I'm accomplishing something. So why wouldn't I wanna maximize my time as efficiently as possible to be as effective as I can with that. And that is why I say free time is the enemy of progress because free time sitting around is not doing. And that's why I try to omit that entirely from my life. This idea is more of a fundamental, it's more of a principle. It's one of like my guiding rules in life. And I wanna address it on this vlog because a lot of people in the comments below and whenever I do Q and A's, a lot of people ask me about what they should do um, when they're sort of at any kind of fork in the road, any sort of crossroads in life, and they need to make a decision, what should they do? And this is like big life decisions, not like what should I have for lunch today? In life, you should only ever be doing one of two things, and that is figuring out what you're most passionate about, like finding your dreams in life, and then two, realizing those passions, realizing those dreams. And the first one is much harder than the second one. If you know what you want to do, no big deal. You just commit your entire life to doing it and you'll either get really close or you'll die trying. But figuring out what it is that excites you, what it is that you're most passionate about in life is really, really tricky. So how, how I approach it, and this is how I've always approached it. This is how I approached it when I was on welfare, when I was 17 years old. This is how I approached it when I was washing dishes, when I was 20. This is how I've approached my entire life. And that is to absolutely fixate on what it is that I wanna be doing all day long every day. Like, what am I doing right now? Is this exactly where I wanna be? And by always checking with myself, always checking in, like always hitting that reset button, I can always be really confident in my actions. 
because I know that my ambition is true. It's like that platitude, without a goal you can't score. I really believe in that, because if you can't see like the goalposts, how do you know which way to kick the ball? Now, this is by no means a shortcut or a way to make life easier. Every time I've sort of made a big decision on what I wanted to do in life, or I, I, I've discovered a passion, it's been then like years of pain and years of struggle to realize or to even get myself on the course to realize that. When I first discovered filmmaking and I was like, this is all I want in life, I was 17 years old, I was on welfare. It took me a, a decade before I figured out how to make a living at it. When I decided that I didn't want to date anymore, I didn't want to be single, that I was unhappy, I wanted a family. It took me years to talk Candace into marrying me, and then actually us getting married, and then having a baby. So, realizing it takes time, and realizing it requires commitment, but it's that first step, that first decision point, that enables you to sort of realize the ambition, or at least begin the process to realize that ambition. This is something I do every day, even now. Uh, I'm 34 years old, I feel like I've come really far in life, but I want to go much further and I'm constantly reevaluating my decisions and what I'm doing to make sure I'm on the path that I want to be on. You know, do I want to live in New York City forever? I don't know. I love this town, but the idea of raising children here scares the crap out of me. So that's something I'm constantly thinking about. So anyways, that's it. It's a pretty simple idea. It's something that I believe in to the point of it being like religion. I am always fixated on what am I doing and what do I want to be doing. And then that guides me. That is like the, that is the lighthouse that I follow through the darkness. So what do I want to be doing right now? Right now I want to be doing two things. Number one, sharing my ideas and sharing my perspectives and making these little creations that I plop on YouTube every day. And number two is my new company. And I know I haven't gotten into it yet, but the ambition behind that company is to build something that can empower, that can affect everyone on planet Earth, that can affect the whole world. Uh, I realize that sounds lofty and ambitious, but, but your grasp should always be just outside your reach. What's the point in having ambitions if they aren't seemingly unattainable? Why does Owen work in a donut shop? Why don't you get him a cool job? Okay, let me spend a little bit of time picking this one apart. So my son, Owen, has his first job right now, and he works at a Krispy Kreme donut place at the cash register selling people donuts, which is a tough job. And yes, I could make a phone call and I could get him some cushy, easy, fun, cool job at like a production company doing something totally awesome. But I'm his father, and I try to do what's best for him at all times. And what's not good for a kid to have as his first job is something cushy and cool. Beyond learning the value of a dollar and beyond learning what the suck means of working in a place like that, he will forever, for the rest of his life, no matter how successful or rich or famous he might become, he will forever treat people that work behind a counter with a level of respect that they deserve because he will appreciate and understand how hard that job is. That's one of the reasons. The bigger reason, two days ago or three days ago, I did a whole vlog about sort of life's principles and what it means to always fixate on what do you want from life and then figure out how to execute that. And a lot of people asked, a lot of people replied with, what's the best way to find your passion? What's the best way to find your calling in life? And I have an answer to that, and I don't know that this answer is right, but this is an answer I firmly believe in. The best way to find what you love in life is by doing something you hate. A cushy job, a cool job, a job that you like is, is comfortable. That comfort breeds complacency, and that complacency breeds stagnation. So you just kind of stay there because it's a fine job, even though it may not be your dream or your passion. And then all kinds of shit happens. She gets pregnant, you buy a car, there's a mortgage payment, you have a house, you have this cushy life. And before you know it, you have these handcuffs, these golden handcuffs that is your day job that you didn't love, you never loved. It was just an easy job, but now there's no way out of it. And all of that happens by doing something that's cushy and easy. If you get a job that absolutely sucks, something you hate doing, you will spend every minute on the clock fixating and fantasizing about what you wish you were doing. 
Where did I find my passion for filmmaking and my drive to do what I do in life? I found it in the bottom of the nastiest, burnt up clam chowder pot ever, working in a shitty seafood restaurant where I'd have to dig so deep into that pot to scrub the bottom that it would get all over my arms and all over my shirt. And I just reeked of stale seafood and it never came off my body. But doing that for years, 50 hours a week, every week for like five years, really galvanized for me what I wished I could be doing. I fantasized about having a job that I loved, about doing something I was super passionate about, about working for myself and not having some asshole boss telling me what to do all the time. I, I obsessed over it. But if I had been in some cushy, some sweet, some fun job that my dad got for me, none of that drive would have been there. So yeah, Owen works in a donut store. And what he will get from working in a donut shop, what he will get from a shitty job, is invaluable and he might not appreciate that and whoever wrote me that comment might not appreciate that but believe me at some point in his life he will look back and he will see that that was one of the most influential jobs he could have ever had i hope otherwise he'll hate me forever for making him work in a donut store let's chat a little about complainers Generally, a complainer is a person who doesn't take responsibility for their own action. A complainer is someone who would always talk about why they failed instead of how to succeed. Now, there's one simple reason why it's never ever okay to complain. And that is, there's always someone that has it worse than you do. Let me give that a little context. So when I think about some of the things in my life that I'd want to complain about, some of the really hard things, and then I give them any sort of real world context, they aren't that consequential. Let me get really specific. When I was 16 years old and I had to drop out of high school to get a terrible job to support my new baby, that was pretty rough. You know, that is a big enough excuse for me to justify any actions I take in my life. I know, but I couldn't do this because. To embrace that as an excuse to complain. But the truth is that's not so bad. Dropping out of high school, like really not having much of a place to live, having no money, having a baby, being on welfare, like all those things really suck. But in the grand scheme of humanity, it's not that bad. Bear with me. I turn on my computer, I go to a news site, and the first story I read is about migrants from Myanmar that are stuck on a boat, stranded, because the Thai government won't let them into port. These are people just like you and me, and they're literally starving to death, and this is right now. I don't mean to be so extreme, but these are the things that I remind myself of anytime I want to complain or bitch about something in my life. You realize that there are people just like you and me who at this very moment are truly facing things we are lucky enough to go our entire lives without ever having to experience. Okay, let me, tell, let me tell one more story to back this up. One more story where like my feelings around complaining and life in general were really set straight. Three years ago I did this project, led like a very small relief mission to the Philippines after they had been devastated by Typhoon Haiyan. This is some of the video here. That was somebody's home. People didn't have water, people didn't have food. You know, these people had nothing. Their livelihoods, their life, their existence had totally been stripped away from them. And what struck me the most about the entire experience, all of my time there, was not once did anyone complain but they lost everything and they didn't complain and they all focused on one thing they focused on change not complaining <laughs> and because of that I do take it personally when people complain because the truth is most of the time people who complain have nothing to complain about who cares if I went to a meeting that doesn't start till tomorrow and who cares if some guy locked up my bike brake cable it really doesn't matter. Do you think it's better to plan out your future all the way through or just play it by ear and see what happens? I apologize if I've said this in the vlog before, I can't remember. And this also isn't my original idea. Someone else told this to me, but it's great. It was a great piece of advice that I'm happy to share. 
I believe in something called the Tarzan method. And what that means is, you are Tarzan, me Tarzan, starting on this side of the jungle, your goals, your dreams, your aspirations, they're the other side of the jungle. And there's no straight line through the jungle. You know what, let me do an animation for you here. The Tarzan method. What that means is you're Tarzan, you're here. And you want to get to the other side of the jungle here. Ideally there's this straight line. But what you find in life, what I've found in life, this is non-existent. This straight line here is a unicorn. It doesn't exist. Instead, you reach and you grab onto whatever vine you can grab onto and you swing. And that vine might carry you in this direction, which doesn't feel like the right direction to your goal. But it does get you a little bit closer. And then you grab onto another vine. It swings you all the way over here, a little bit closer. And then you swing in this direction, and then this direction, and this direction, and this direction, and this direction, and this direction. And eventually you make it to where you want to be. But the beauty of the Tarzan method, the kind of the magic of being open-minded in your pursuit, is that like these unknowns, like where it might take you that you didn't imagine, that's usually where you find something that is actually what your goals are. I don't believe that there is a straight line between where you are and where you want to be in life ever. Not with family, not with romantic interests, and especially not with your career. So an open-mindedness, even if it looks like this, will yield results and outcomes that otherwise would have been unforeseeable. Nicole asks, how do you get yourself out of a rut? Work. Work is the answer to a lot of problems. It cures depression, heartbreak, all those things. You just, when you're in a bad place, I bury myself with work. The progress and the physical activity and the brain distraction, it like breaks me out of anything. I like this question. Bosco wants to know, divide into percentage these factors to reach success. Natural talent, luck, and determination. Natural talent is highly overrated. It's determination, 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 and then like luck and all that other education and all that. It's like, it's not even in the same pie chart. Carlos asks, what makes you proud of yourself? Okay, that's a weird way to phrase it, but how I have confidence in who I am and the decisions I make is that I have this moral compass in life and it is like, it is a, a summation or an amalgam of everything that I believe in, everything that I think is right and fair and just. And every decision that I make, personal, private, business, every decision that I make is made through the looking glass, through the perspective of my moral compass, of what I believe is right and what I believe is wrong. And if it's wrong, I don't make that decision. I only make decisions that I believe in. And the aggregate of that, you do that over enough time and it gives you a sense of pride. It gives you a sense of, of confidence in, in what you've done in life. Eli wants to know, how has vlogging helped you as a filmmaker? Anyone that works in any creative field knows that when there's no impetus to create, it's very hard to make something. Meaning like, without a deadline, it's hard to actually finish. Like that awesome platitude that I love to preach, without a goal, you can't score. So how vlogging has helped me as a filmmaker, it, it's forced me to make a new movie every day. And by doing that, my skills have improved, my editing has improved, my confidence in my editing has improved. Everything's been moved forward because of this law, because of this like self-imposed daily deadline. Carlos, what's the meaning of life? Carlos, existentialism is a very dangerous thing. Ignore it, get back to work. That was the first step in a very long process. Um, I can't underscore enough that it's never any one thing that takes you where you wanna be. What's it like to be your own boss? You know, the last time I actually, I had a boss, I was 21 years old. So I've worked for myself almost my entire adult life. I don't know that I could function in any other environment. I don't do well when I have someone questioning my judgment, and I don't do well when I have to trust the judgment of someone else simply because they're my superior. Um, I just, I don't do well in that environment. Yeah, I just watched, rewatched this amazing Steve Jobs quote from like 1996. So, the thing I would say is, when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your 
your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. But life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. All right, Casey, what is your favorite quote? Okay, it's in the foreword to a book called Herzog on Herzog. And the quote is something like, don't quote me on this. It's something like, never have a plan B. People with a plan B will invariably fall back on it. That's why they have it in the first place. It's a good one, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you get bored? No. And the reason why I don't get bored is because there's always a list, whether it's like in my head or literally on paper, I'm sure you're the same way, yeah. of things that need to be done. So anytime there's like free time that would be occupied by boredom, you just have, there's stuff to do, there's work to do. Do you so, ever get bored? I do, but it's my own fault. If I'm, if I'm bored, I gotta change it up. Yeah, that's, change that's it I up. That's when I know that it's time to change. What do you enjoy most about work? Um, for me, work is, is about being productive, it's about doing something. That sense of accomplishment or that sense of productivity is what I enjoy most about work. Uh, and to me, like work and life are one and the same. So all of those values hold true when thinking about life in general. How do you manage being so optimistic about everything? What's the alternative? To be negative or cynical? There's more than enough negativity in this world. And negativity doesn't feel good. Negativity is just easy. So if you put in the time to work hard at being positive and being optimistic, it's a much better life. But it does take more work. Negative people are typically lazy people.